Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Beyond the Plays series talk back for American Players Theater's production of Rough Crossing by Tom Stoppard. My name is Jake Penner, and I'm an artistic associate here at APT, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, and today is really your time to ask any questions or share any thoughts about the play or the production in general with the cast of Rough Crossing. Uh, and if you have any questions, please just type those into the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will address them as they come up. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome the cast of Rough Crossing. Um, Kelsey Brennan, you want to pop on? Hey, Kelsey. Marcus Trushinsky. Jim Ridge. David Daniel. And Josh Krause. And we may have Jamal James joining us in a moment. Uh, we'll say hi to him as soon as he pops on. But uh, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> good, good. Uh, all right, let's have a look here at the, well, we'll give everybody a, a couple of minutes to type any questions that you might have about the play into the Q&A box. But um, how about we just start with an easy one? Uh, what was it like for, for anyone to be back on the Hill after a year and a half plus away? Um, did this feel familiar or did it feel like you're you're shaking off some cobwebs uh, getting back in the rehearsal room and up the hill? <laughs> it, was, it was surely different. It was very, it was different, but I mean, the energy in the room I felt like was the thing that I, that made me be like, oh, I can, I can relax into this because everybody felt was in the same boat, but um and it was just great to be in the room with, with all of those people. It was, that was really cool and exciting to me. But I also felt like I have no idea what I'm doing right before it. And then I was like, oh, I kind of remember how this goes a little bit. Great. Um, so, uh, uh, I, we, you've, we've got a, a rich history with Tom Stoppard plays here at APT. And I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts about any of the particular challenges that you find in working on a Tom Stoppard piece, or if there was anything different about doing Rough Crossing versus any of the other productions uh, from, from previous years, Arcadia or, uh, or what have you. I think that um, much like some of the other plays we do that have dense language and um, and profound ideas in them. Stoppard's writing is hard to dig yourself out of a hole if you make a mistake um, because he uses such rich vocabulary and very often if you forget a word, you're not gonna find another one to replace whatever it was he was saying. So you're kind of screwed. <laughs> um, but I, honestly, I feel like, I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel. I, feel our play is kind of zany and fun and it's full of people making mistakes. So I guess in terms of the stopper that I've done, which I guess would just be travesties twice, um, there's a little bit more leeway with this one, but certainly I feel like when I step on stage to do stopper, I'm like, okay, I gotta know these words. I gotta really know these words or everybody's gonna know that uh, I goofed. So a little added pressure. This particular play seems to me to be uh, closer to a classic farce than uh, other plays that I'm familiar with that Stoppard has done. Um, but this is the first Stoppard play that I've acted in. Um, so there's a lot of like comedy math that goes into the building of it. Um, and uh, that's part of the joy of being in rehearsal and especially working with with these people is that we have such a, a rich history together that <laughs> almost every night you can find a conversation going on backstage. Hey, why isn't this thing landing? What, what do I need to do to tweak this? Or, or um, there's just a constant working at it because the math is uh, really, it's really intricate. Uh we have a, a couple of questions already uh, from Patty Franson says, I saw the show a couple of weekends ago and loved it. 
how hard was it not to break character and laugh during each other's antics? So funny. Thank you for the laughter. I have this question myself. I, has anybody broken in a severe way yet during the run? <laughs> Don't any of you admit it at all. <laughs> Nobody can admit it. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, luckily, it was right at the very, it was at the final kiss of the show that I broke. God. Um, yeah. Uh, and it had, it had nothing to do with what Kelsey was doing or bringing to the kiss. Uh, it was, that was fine. It was the um, unfortunate plastic cup that clanged uh, out in the house just as we finished our duet together perfectly on pitch. And then our kiss interrupted by the clanking of plastic. Uh, that made me... <laughs> I remember pulling Kelsey in and just holding her really tight. Like, no, we're not going to do two kisses. It's going to, it's just going to be one. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be laughing the entire time. And Jackie needs to bring those lights down way faster and good. That's what I remember. Yeah. I'm guilty of that one too. That was a good night. It was a good night. <laughs> I happen to be there on uh, one of the nights where uh, if you've seen the show there, the silver tray platters fit prominently into the plot. And then uh, on one of these nights, somebody had dropped a tray and it actually rolled end over end for a good eight, nine seconds. And I thought, <laughs> sure, I was going to see somebody go, but y'all held it together really nicely. So kudos on that one. Um, cycling back to comedy math, Mary Hamel, Hamel, excuse me if I got that wrong. Um, what do you mean by comedy math? Uh, all right. So maybe we just pick a, a, a moment and talk about how you constructed this in the rehearsal room. Maybe something having to do with um, any number of, of Didi Dvornicek's uh, um, cognac uh, mis redirects. Well, math, math is a shorthand for, um, it's a shorthand for how the comedy works. So you could say the machine of it, the gears of it, because it's, um, there's a lot of pieces that have to fit together, little pieces, and we each have to know our part in order to make that work. We have to decide in the rehearsal where the final laugh is. There are lots of places where each one of us could get a little laugh in a scene. So we have to decide, are we going for these for five little laughs or do we do the math, build it, get those gears working in such a way that it's one, two, three, four, and then everybody laughs a much bigger laugh on five. So when you write, when you're looking at the math of something, it's bump, 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 bump. You, you feel the math of it. If it's wrong, you go like, ah, oh, that's not quite it. So that's what Jim is talking about. We're always looking at the math of that. And sometimes even as Jim said, even now we're still we're still having those conversations backstage because we're getting better at hearing it in a finer detail, in a much finer, <laughs> in a much finer detail than uh, when we started. So as we get to know the play better and better and better and better, our ears become sharper about our jobs. Little things, the tempo of speaking, the pitch of speaking, uh, when there's a pause or when there's not, I mean, we, Kelsey Marcus in rehearsals, we talked about what the um, a parakeet could take your place. Yeah, it's like when there's their breath, when is there not? When do you give the audience just a tiny bit to catch up with you? When do you want to keep going so fast that they're leaning forward and they can't keep up with you? And that's the fun of it, too. Those are all questions that we have to kind of keep asking ourselves. <laughs> Do you find that you get to a point to where you think you have that math absolutely perfect and then you go out, try to land that beat and it falls completely flat? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the humidity will determine what the math is on any given night as much as anything else, the humidity. In that same vein, it's always the thing that you think is the funniest. Like the thing in the rehearsal hall that we all laughed at. Um, never seems to pan out yeah um yeah it's because we've seen it six times eight times so this shift the new thing is funny but yeah i think um, i think audiences would have had a great time just watching us trying to figure out the math of when the ship tilts like we're in the room like so wait a minute 
literally we had someone putting arms out doing this. So you're like, wait, I'm rolling this way or I'm trying to climb up the deck. Like that was comedy in and of itself, just trying to figure out which way we're rolling at any given time. I, when it comes to those, um, they call them surges in the in the script, right? So when it comes to those, was that a tedious process of choreographing those? I, I remember watching them during the during the tech process and thinking this must have taken hours to get right because everybody has to be doing something different. But the direction the ship tips is the same for everybody. Yes. How did it go? Tedious. How did that day yes, go? Yes, it was tedious. Yes. Well, the thing is, we can't see what it looks like, right? So we are all physically trying to move in a way as an ensemble where it looks like we're experiencing the same physical, um, ex having the same physical experience that isn't really actually happening in real life. And that's really tough to get your bodies to move in a way that communicates to the audience that you're, you're on a boat and you're all feeling the same wave. Um, I just remember fine tuning it. <laughs> there was a couple days where it was like, yeah, we need a break. This is like isometric exercises. I mean, you're literally like holding your body to pretend that you're off balance is really engaging all of your balance muscles. So um, when we get to the end of it, for those of you who haven't seen it, it does eventually end. But when the boat levels off and three of us get to relax and sigh, I'm, there's no acting there. I'm actually very happy that that part of the play is over. <laughs> Uh, we have a couple comments from uh, a, a few audience members. Um, Sue Poznanski, not a question, just wanted to let you know I've been coming since the early 90s and I have never laughed as much as I did when we saw Rough Crossing. Thank you so much for saying that, Sue. Um, welcome back. Uh, and Pamela Mir says, welcoming everyone back to APT with this colorful show has been a delight. Kudos with the directing as David Daniel and Jim Ridge both recognize the audience with those opening sequences. It's like you each are telling us you're glad to see us back. Okay, I actually have a question about this. What Was this something that you all discovered in the rehearsal room or was this something that, that Bill Brown, our director, came into the room and said, we, we have to do something that makes people feel seen in this moment after not having been seen watching you know, film captures and Zoom productions over the, the previous year? What do you what do you think, Jim? I I don't know if he decided this winter, uh, but he certainly right away he knew that he was going to do something like that, um, and he's he's tried to design a little bit of a moment like that for everybody. Um, the first one that's a little harder to see because the focus isn't there. Jamal, who comes out to do the curtain speech, he looks through the porthole in the door. Right, so there's there's all kinds of like, oh, there you are. Um, but Bill was really, really very, very specific about, let's take them in and let's let them take us in and say hello and then get on with it. I mean, that's it. And it, it works for a comedy, it's really great. But even if this were a tragedy, it's the same thing to, that Bill was very cognizant of coming out of that quarantine that he just wanted everyone to connect with each other, whatever our story was going to be, which is a kind of a staple of a Bill Brown show, is that he loves really laying in that connection between the audience and the storytellers on stage. So that's always an important thing for him. We get to do it a little more overtly in this one, but yeah, absolutely essential to the, to this production. Great. Uh, Patty Franson has another question. Uh, I've had this question for a while, actually, Patty. Uh, the ship shifting was absolutely hilarious. And seriously, how did you all hold it together when Marcus drifted through nearly eight accents in about as many seconds? That was so funny. I, Marcus, I know you've been thinking about this for a while uh, prior to rehearsal. How did you come up with that decision to, to have him do those specific accents in the in, in that rehearsal sequence in Act Two? I, I would also like to hear some of the ones that we didn't use, some of the ones that we did in rehearsal that didn't make it to the stage. So that's just my side quest. It start, yeah, before we did the first read through, I was like, I had the idea, but I was, I was nervous about doing it <laughs> for the first read through. Um, but the, I love the movie Tootsie. And um, at the end of Tootsie during the last soap opera where Dustin Hoffman takes off his wig and he says, I'm Edward Kimberly. 
and was kind of the impetus for the entire character. Um, but the switching, because in this one moment, he reveals Justin, the character, who's the international jewel thief, reveals himself to be a completely other character, Bobby Tompkins, who is also a ping pong world champion. I was like, there has to be some kind of major shift. And so the first time I did it in the read through, um, I went from Justin being this kind of international jewel thief um, to being fully like, my name is, my name is Bobby Tompkins. And um, which, uh, you know, was fun to do. And then Bill eventually started just throwing things out. And we started kind of messing around with doing a, a bunch of different ones. And the, the three that are in the show were three of probably 20 versions as we did it. But that was very, it was so much fun. Including the kilt, including right. the kilt. Yeah. Uh, along those same lines, uh, Jack, I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, if you've seen the show, you know that Adam has a pretty severe speech impediment literally he's impeded from speaking uh, quite often in the show i what was your process for building that into your character was that something that came naturally or were you applying a lot of comedy math to that over the course of the rehearsal process uh it was all math and a big shout out to uh our voice and text uh coach eva who helped me with not just what that is vocally but physically as well um, the voice is a physical mechanism. So to understand what the process of creating speech and where exactly the impediment occurs and where it occurs was really helpful. And Eva was, uh, was crucial in me figuring that out for myself uh, to make it repeatable, to make it safe to do on uh, eight times a week sometimes. Um, uh, and, and eventually, once I, once I discovered the math of it, after so many iterations of it just not being specific enough, it's not clear what this is. It's something, but it's not immediately recognizable. It, had a, it has, like everything else in the show, it has to strike a perfect balance of uh, it is clearly this one thing, but Turai calls it, oh, what are you, uh, uh, his description of it, it, he, it's an odd, it's an odd way of an, an impediment. So there has to be something just a little strange about it. Um, anyway, uh, it, it took a while. And then once it finally, once the math was clear, I was finally able to mess around with it so every day now it's a little different and searching for it and finding it in the moment I and mean, it's just fun jake josh also went through a couple of different dialects uh finding adam yeah that's not the one we started with i was i, I was not aware with, uh, of that at all josh what were some of the other places of origin uh, it was always it was always a french dialect but uh originally it was very minor brush strokes of it uh uh mostly just a placement and um uh before uh and that was even before uh justin Deverell had fully formed himself we were all discovering how far we could push this this play and these characters and eventually Bill just wanted the vibrancy of all the different sounds that any sound we can make as vibrant as possible. That was the color we all wanted. Uh, and I, I think it's just lovely to be on stage and hear all those different sounds enveloping us out on that stage. Great. For, for those of you who don't know, I, the, the production team uh, for any play here at APT is, is augmented with a voice and text coach who works very closely with the cast and the director uh, to make sure that, that things like dialect and uh, syntax pacing, all of those things are, are in line with the, uh, the way that the author had intended the play to be played. Um, and on this uh, show in particular, uh, we got some help uh, on the musical side of things because even though that Rough Crossing isn't technically a piece of musical theater, 
Uh, there are moments for which song is the most appropriate form of expression for characters in certain moments. So I wanted to ask you all, what was it like creating those moments? Uh, I've heard it joked that Rough Crossing is technically the first musical APT has done up the hill. Um, and I don't know that that's technically true, but um, how did this differ from a traditional rehearsal process? Let's say doing a Shakespeare or any other stopper. Well, it's a Bill Brown play, so there was bound to be music in it. Um, um, and he always works really closely with Andy, Andy Hansen, who is the composer. And um, they, had, they had that music mapped out from, well, they had the major ideas of it mapped out before they got here. And then I was privy to conversations that were going on between Bill and our stage manager, Jackie Singleton, saying, ask him, ask him if I can get just a little bit more, or ask him if this is, are we in the right, uh, are we in the right world with this little bit? Um, so it was being changed all the way into tech, as far as I know. Um, but Kelsey really had the, <laughs> she carries a lot of that, the, the singing. I had no idea I was in a musical until <laughs> just now no um you know you get a script and there's songs in it there's songs in every shakespearean comedy and, and you're like oh okay but um i don't know this one feels a little bit different <laughs> in that you know i think of my song with josh mostly where we we are actually playing out a scene together through this song and that's what a musical is so i don't know how i come down on that but um you know, we had music rehearsals and all of the musical or all of the music is original. Um, the lyrics are written by Stafford, but the music is all um, original music uh, composed by Andy Hansen. And what is so beautiful about that is he's writing for our voices. And there was one day where we were trying to figure out um, by half steps, if you know music, where we should, what key we should write the opening song in. And I just stood on the balcony, I sang it in three different keys. And I was like, I don't know, you tell me what sounds like you want it to sound. So having the ability to um, make the music work for our purposes, for our voices is um, something really unique that you wouldn't get. And we won't get when we do, I don't know, Marcus, what musical do you want to do? Into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one really would work out there. Um, but it's an interesting conversation about, um, about singing on stage. And we talked a lot about it and about the use of ampli amplification and what it means on the stage and particularly that stage because it's hard to mic people um, because the sound, the, the theater space is so wide and without a roof, you can't quite keep the sound in the place where everybody can hear it in the same way, like you can with an indoor theater. And um, so I think we finally settled on just not having it at all, like it would, like we would be in uh, any other play and that our voices would be able to carry um, out there in a way that amplification would kind of change the sound. And I, I know we're in constant um, conversation uh, about that at APT and about um, the natural sound of the voice wanting to keep that intact at our theater. Um, but, you know, it's different. <laughs> we want everybody to be able to hear and hear the story simultaneously. And so um, it's an interesting conversation with, if we are pushing more into these plays that have music in them, how to, keep it all in the same world in some ways. Also, Jake, I, I would say that not everyone was happy with the music. Uh, there was some anger and resentment uh, by some people who were, I don't know, excluded from, uh, I don't know, whatever that was, the, the, the kind of special bond that came from people singing and dancing and sharing joy together and then being that one person who doesn't get to do any of that. So I guess you just kind of have to make it up yourself uh, to participate. So not everyone got to sing, Jake, is all I want to say. And I, I, that's not true. Not mentioning you, any names. I just want to make sure added, you know that you added, management, I will you totally added your own song. Brilliant. You sing. Yep. 
I was just going to say. I literally begged Bill a dozen times to be included at the end of Act One, and uh, he said no. <laughs> That's too bad. But he, do, but Dvorak does kind of seem as though he's in a slightly different piece at times. I mean, he's not as affected as the surges uh, for for a very specific reason. I mean, he seems like he's floating above it at times. You think that floating about is David. good. Yeah, you think that I, about David in every production. It's just a little outside of the play. Um, all right, before we go too deep down that road. Uh, uh, so we have another question from Sue. She was there on the 20th. <laughs> uh, did any of you notice the mouse on stage that snuck under a chair? Or are, you, are you all so involved in the production that you no longer notice those live distractions? Just that was a mouse? The hill. <laughs> I definitely oh. noticed something. Was I sitting in the chair? If I was sitting in the chair, Sue, I was aware that something crawled under the chair. Did not know it was a mouse. Happy I didn't know. Anyone else? I, I will say for our nature lovers out there, because we always have nature stories, uh, this season, this show, there were wrens, a set of wrens that, had, uh, that made a nest and had their uh, chicks. And we named them, we named them Ilona and Justin. And so every night during rehearsal and then during the performance, they're sitting in their nest just uh, backstage. And so we always, we call her Ilona because Ilona, she's the loudest one over and over and over again. So <laughs> all the perks of working up the hill here. Um, so I had a question for Jamal. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know that we're going to get Jamal James uh, uh, this afternoon, but um, my, the question I would have asked him is, how does he eat all of that on stage? But he's actually not the only one consuming things at all times. Didi, you, how many shots of cognac do you have over the course of the show? I mean, is this, is this something that you're... It's, it's you know, I, having spent many years out here with your friends, there are all kinds of hidden joys. And one of them is uh, looking at my friend, Jim Ridge, who is doing like a steam engine's role in this show, keeping the show on track and moving forward. And I drink all the liquids <laughs> I care to. And he is on stage just pouring sweat and I get to drink all of his drinks. That's a special kind of joy. That is a special kind of joy. So no, I don't mind drinking at all. Give me more drinks as long as Jim Ridge doesn't get to drink anything. <laughs> Uh, along those lines, Jim, I, arguably you're at the center of this piece. And does, uh, is there anything that you're doing special to take care of yourself while you're driving the action of this of this piece forward? Because it seems like a pretty physically demanding show for everybody, but for but for you especially. Um, uh, during so during the show, uh, it took me a little while, probably the first week and a half to learn um, how not to push vocally in places where I didn't need to. Um, what, we had our, one of our first texts and somebody backstage said, it was, it was as though you thought you were never gonna do a play ever again in that moment. I just spent it all. Um, so that was helpful to learn how to um, modulate that um, for like eight show weeks. Um, I don't know. I take naps. I quit drinking a beer after performances, which I really enjoy, but many times, um, I don't know what else. They let me change my shirt last night. Wardrobe said I could wear an extra shirt. So I got to change out of the really wet one. You know, it's, it's all really interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, before we thank everybody for being here and, uh, and, and say goodbye, uh, does anybody have anything else to add about uh, how this process has gone for you? Any surprises, any real train wrecks on stage, any good stories from, uh, uh, from anything going awry last minute? I don't have a train wreck, but it's, oh, I was just gonna say, I don't have a train wreck, but it, it, it is pretty great to hear people laughing. It's been a long time coming and it's it's really great to be back in the theater and hear everybody laugh. Yeah, along those same lines, it's amazing. We're, um, we're only selling the theater to half capacity right now. 300 people feels like 
a huge audience right now. And all of us, I think, um, have adjusted what a full house looks and feels like at APT. So I cannot imagine what the next comedy is going to feel like when 1,100 people are laughing. It's like, I know I've experienced it before, but um, I think it's going to blow my socks off because 400 people feels like, you know, the Super Bowl. All right. Well, I think that's about all the time we have uh, for today. These folks all have a show tonight. Um, so thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Um, please keep an eye out for future Beyond the Play series events. Uh, we'd love for you to come back and see us. And uh, thank you so much for coming out to see us this year. It's been a long time coming. And I, I know that I speak on behalf of the entire organization when I say that uh, it's been great seeing you all again. Um, so have a great rest of the night, and we'll see you all soon.